This is According to Callus. It is a Thursday, and as I discussed, I'm going to be talking about the idea of Huxley versus Orwell, right? So, now, once upon a time, back in 2009, there was an article, a long article, put out by uh, Stuart McMillan. Now, I read this thing at least 10 years ago at this point. Um, it was probably two, two to three years old when I read it. So it was called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And it was a comparison of these two authors and the vision, right? The totalitarian, the dystopia that they were predicting. And I'm going to do the bullet points courtesy of a webcomic adaption of that article. And that was put out on uh, June 8th, 2013 by something called Biblocleck. Now, I can't say anything about the website per se. I just kind of glance at it. It looks like it's got a lot of book art stuff on it. it. looks somewhat interesting. I wouldn't get lost in the weeds. The webcomic fairly breaks down what was the article. So I'm going to use that for the basis of this episode. So if this, in the slightest bit, interests you, please join me at the podcast. We'll see you there. Okay, so as we soldier on, we have... If you'll bear with me for just a second as I make some adjustments here. We have the concept put forward that who is a more accurate author in discerning what was going to happen. Now, I remember as a kid, particularly in the early 80s, everybody was up in arms about the concept that we were going to go the 1984 route. What's ironic is that it took an extra say, 20 years to get there. But even then, we're not really fully there, right? And it's almost been 40 years additional, and we're not fully there. But there have been a lot of other things that have occurred in the meantime. So let me give you a brief recap. Again, this is courtesy of this webcomic, which is, again, based upon the article written by Stuart McMillan back in May of 2009 called Amusing Ourselves to Death. I'm trying to give credit where credit's due. I I could try and do most of this off the top of my head, but I I would think I would be doing a disservice to this topic. I would be underselling the idea or the importance that what these two books as far as mindsets put forth in the zeitgeist of today. So, I will just kind of read the bullet points courtesy of the webcomic. Here we go. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book. For no one would want to read a book. Now, which do you think is more accurate? The the irony is, is it's both, right? Both and? Orwell filled, or I'm sorry, Orwell Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egotism. Again, which is more accurate? And I would suggest to you that we've got both. Now, when this article was written a little over 10 years ago, I think probably the, the, the tilt towards Huxley would have had a lot more sway. But as time's gone on, again, it's more both. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned by a sea of irrelevance. Again, it's both and. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and centrifugal bubbly puppy, or bumble puppy. (laughs) I'm sorry, it's just, again, both and, right? Both and. All right, Huxley remarked that the, in Brave New World Revisited, okay, so now, I think I actually have that book somewhere. Since I moved, it got put up, but 
let me let me just read this real quick. Civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever alert to oppose tyranny fail to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. Wow. <laughs> Man, it, that's just like a gut punch there. I ha- I <laughs> wow. <laughs> Guys, I like I said I I read the uh I read the article a long time ago, so most of this is just a, a revisit. So <laughs> not surprised. But yeah, that that's that's really something. I it's painful to consider. All right, in 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain, right, through the Ministry of Peace. In Brave New World, people are controlled by inflicting pleasure. Yeah, now, as an aside, one of those pleasurable instruments was called Soma, right? It was a drug that you could take and just gave you the constant euphoria. I find it extremely humorous that there is a muscle relaxer that is currently on the market that goes by Soma. In fact, I've used it for muscle pain and spasms. I mean, it's not like I need it very often, but the couple times that I took it, woo-wee, it worked. Muscles felt better by the next day. Um, Certainly not something you want to play around with, right? Kind of like fire. Useful tool, but a uh, fearful master. Um, So, in short, Orwell feared that what we hate would ruin us. And Huxley feared that which we love would ruin us. Oh, well. I apologize. So the actual author of this was Neil Postman. I should have remembered that. So all worlds, all of these words come from amusing ourselves to death, colon, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business by Neil Postman, a book about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. So my apologies. I, I did get that wrong. So Stuart McMillan was the guy that made the web comic that adapts and kind of updates Postman's uh, book-length essay. Like I said, I, I did read it a long time ago, and basically the argument, the argument of the authors, both authors, is that Huxley was more accurate than George Orwell. Now, I once saw a follow-up to this um, that basically put it like on the Huxley Orwell scale, right? And then maybe you saw those things floating around in 2020 where you would say, you are here, where it's, you know, the the Zen diagram, right? I got to say that on the whole, I think the fruition of the situation was via Huxley's vision But as time has gone on, we have drifted closer and closer to Orwell's prediction or Orwell's vision, if you will. Now, like I said, about 10 years ago is when I read this. And I had several conversations with coworkers at the time that I felt like for myself when I was talking to them that this could not be sold. In other words, you couldn't put Orwell on people, right? The, The vision of him. You couldn't put that his vision into place until you made people agreeable to it. And the way you could make people agreeable to it was by instituting the Huxley vision, right? So you've got the ultimate distraction. Nobody really is organized for anything. And and at some point, the general public is going to have enough of the chaos, enough of the nothingness, and they're going to want something And they're going to crave institutions. They're going to crave people to come in and fill that void. They're going to crave their vision of duty, honor, justice, right? Now, I use those terms knowing full well that that's part of the recruitment lingo for the military. And I, I know that a good number of the people that I 
interact with that are more civil libertarian than you would maybe initially guess or think are former military. And I think, and I know for me personally, to some degree, it changes your outlook, right? You agree to be doing certain things for a certain period of time and you agree to basically not question anything that you're told to do for a period of time. But after that's done, you're done. You 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 mentally click back into place and you're like, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. I, I am my own person and I will be forever more. So as we look around us in the world today, we can clearly see both of these visions are being implemented even as we speak. Both of these visions are basically dueling for supremacy at this time. Now clearly, the Huxley vision had the the upper hand in this but now now the orwell vision's coming in and it's almost as if it's the right boot and the left boot right one of the one of the fears that i have especially and i'm going to change topics slightly for just a moment but when i deal with my republican brethren when i deal with my conservative friends and they seem to be just a okay with government solutions so long as they're the, their solutions that they agree with. But on the other hand, they argue for limited government. They argue for limited government through the idea that there is a rule of law. And then they reject both of those to get a goal that they want. When they get a, they're looking at an outcome that they desire, they're willing to set aside those very principles that they espouse. Indeed, you know, whether it's the drug war, whether it's um, invasive searches, whether it's, you know, basically, I hate to say it, anything that could be seen as a vice. Conservatives seem to be okay with letting government come in and putting a stop to it. And I just find that very troubling. Likewise, when there are abuses that go along the lines of what would be predictable in an Orwell vision, their knee-jerk reaction is to defend them. And I understand that, right? Everybody likes order. Everybody wants a peaceful society. I just wonder if there isn't a way to accomplish that or at least maintain that without putting on the jackboots, without calling in the enforcers. Now, over the uh, Independence Day weekend, I watched a number of videos that had to do with the the Dirty Harry. Um, I guess there's five movies, so I I don't know what the proper term is for that. But the first four movies are in a little bit quicker succession, but the fifth one comes much later. But the first two movies deal with that left-right dichotomy, right? When the first movie came out... Um, Harry's dealing with like the abused abuses that were allowed with the kind of the hippie lefty culture. And he was fighting back against that. And there was some pushback on that. And and John Milanis, I saw him interviewed on this. He basically said, yeah, 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 we did that. And they, they kept painting him as a fascist. They kept put it, painting Harry as a stormtrooper or else. And then his response was, you know, basically like, oh, well, if that's what you think, we're going to give you these guys. So they have the motorcycle, the motorcycle cops in the movie are basically look like little Nazi stormtroopers. Right. And so that's the full on fascist push where it's enforcement that's lethal. And there is no jury. There's no judge. It's only the executioner. And of course, Harry doesn't go for that either. He fights back. So. Again, it's almost as if you've got the Huxley and the Orwell dichotomy going on there, right? There is a push-pull mechanism, a left-right. We want an outcome, and we don't really care how we get the outcome or what methods we use to get to that outcome. But ultimately, 
It's about control. They want to control the populace. They want to put people into a situation where they're dependent on government. They can't think for themselves. And they just follow orders. And again, you, you may remember a quote that I've thrown out a time or two before from John Dewey. Children who know how to think for themselves spoil the harmony of the collective society that is coming when or where everyone would be independent or interdependent. Think on that for a minute. That means that nobody can be on their own. Nobody can be the slightest bit self-sufficient. Nobody is allowed to be successful. Both Huxley and Orwell do talk about that. They, they, they do imply that that's the way the masses are treated. But what's always overlooked in common knowledge conversations is even in both of those societies, there is an elite that is not bound by the rules that the rest of those societies must follow. An elite that doesn't really have to answer to anyone or follow the guidelines of which they take part in putting out. They're exempt. As an interesting aside, before I go further, Congress is largely exempt from any laws that they put out. So, I mean, why would that surprise us? You know, the irony is, for me personally, is we spend all of our time fighting the left, right, communist, um, capitalist, uh, right, left, um, white versus everybody, everybody versus white. How, however you want to break it up, we stand divided all the time. It would be warranted and it would be interesting for some of us to be able to sit back and look at who's directing, who's pulling those strings. Just consider for the moment, you know, don't don't go off in a tinfoil hat land. Don't, you know, don't throw me into that briar patch, if you will. We can talk conspiracy. We can talk about all that stuff, but that's not really what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is clearly things are going on that can be articulated by two visions that see the same general outcome. Clearly, there have been people at work pushing things for 100 plus years. Clearly, there is a divide, real or imagined, and both in our own country, in multiple divisions, if you will. But don't you, don't you see, don't you feel the manipulation that's at play? Don't, don't you feel like there's always that push, right? While we just finally get settled into a rhythm, maybe things are okay, and there's that little push. Now, some people refer to those as, you know, red flag events. Some people um, call them false flags. Some people, you know, th there's many different names, but there's always the push, right? We're just going to give them a little push. There was a guy that worked for a former president that talked about the idea that we just we just have to give the general public, the, the American public, a little push. Put them the way we want them to be. Sometimes they do it with tax incentives. Sometimes they do it by scaring people. Sometimes they do it by punishing people. There's the whole carrot and the stick, right? So, you know, Huxley's the carrot and Orwell's the stick. And we're going to give people things to love that distract them. Meanwhile, scaring them about things that they have little to no control about. Again, does it sound familiar? Can you consider, just for a moment, setting aside your own presuppositions at who's at fault and who's to blame and what the... Is this possibly part of a greater thing going on? Forget the New World Order, the giant cabal, whatever you, want, whatever you guys want to call it. Don't get lost in that. That... Whether or not that's true is not relevant to this conversation. What's relevant to this conversation is that you and I and thousands of other people like us, we, we have our own independent thoughts. We have things what we would like to do and things that we enjoy, things we dislike. But by and large, none of us wants to be spending our time thinking about what other people are doing or considering you know, what liberty is going to be trampled tomorrow? 
we we don't necessarily derive our enjoyment by checking in on the latest action coming out of city hall, school board, Texas House, or Texas uh, legislature, or however you want to. Most of us don't derive pleasure out of doing that. It, it's done basically as a necessity, as a self defense mechanism. If if we don't pay attention to what's going on, and they continue to just do these things. By the time we wake up, by the time we acknowledge, hey, uh, this isn't real, it might be too late. Again, consider the idea. Why are there so many distractive things? I mean, consider. Why are they afraid to let you know the truth? Why are they afraid to let you discuss certain things? Why are they afraid... To have an actual free conversation between different peoples, and when I say they, you put anybody's name on it. I'm, I, I'm not gonna tell you who that is because everybody has their different opinions or different ideas. Who they is? Again, don't, don't get lost in that weed or weeds. Per, <laughs> definitely a double entendre there, but don't. Don't worry about that fine detail of who is actually pulling the strings. Just acknowledge the strings. Just start by looking at things from a fresh point of view and consider that we spend so much time chasing our tails, figuratively speaking, trying to fix things that are not fixable or trying to return things to greatness that you know, maybe you didn't experience before, or maybe it's fictionalized. Maybe it's um, Hollywoodized, right? I saw something earlier today where they're basically rewriting what happened at the Alamo. Well, I, if it was really verifiable truth, and that was really what their objective objective was, I would probably be open to having that conversation, open to explaining how that all works. But the myth's powerful. Everybody has myths. Everybody likes to sell the idealized view of what happened or what's going to happen or how it was. But truth matters, right? Truth is what both sets us free and clears up discrepancies. Truth is supposed to be Acknowledged objectively. So, again, whether it's Huxley where he gives you so much garbage in his vision that you can't possibly figure out what is truth, or Orwell where they actively stomp out that truth or rewrite that truth so that you can never know it, ultimately it's about taking truth away from you. Taking truth away from people in general. Because if you don't know what the truth is, you can't be free. You know, I I struggle with the idea that sometimes it's better to go along than get along. Sometimes it's just better to suck it up and go the next day, right? That's That's certainly not... An implication, or let me rephrase that, it's certainly not a complication that I want in my life. The implications of that being that, you know, you go with your gut reaction, you rebel or you fight back and you lose, then those consequences could be even worse. I mean, as a younger man and I had young children at home, a young wife, that put a lot of responsibility on me and it it made me become a better man. It made me want to do better for my family, but it also required me to keep in check my natural inclination to fight back, my natural inclination to call BS on certain things, my natural inclination to just not comply. Fortunately, I'm at the point in my life now that I don't have young children. And I have a wife that's more than capable of taking care of herself. So when the time comes, and it may not ever have to come, I fully expect 
that I will be able to rest easy in the peaceful non-compliance. So whether it's the carrot or the stick, I don't plan on going along with what the latest narrative is. I don't plan on falling for the zeitgeist. And I would caution all of you, my friends, I would caution you, don't get caught up in the Huxley distraction or the Orwell extinction. Don't get caught up on who's more right, who's more wrong. Don't get caught up on what they're doing. Acknowledge it's there. Put a check on it and continue on with your life. They only have power over you unless, well, first you have to let them exert that power over you. And the more of us that don't let them exert that power over us, the more difficult it becomes for them to do that. Of course, ultimately, they can always find a few people to make examples of. Ultimately, through the use of force, they can get most of what they want. All I would suggest is there has to be a cost. Those that would seek to enforce the Orwell vision, they're going to have to come out from behind wherever they've been hiding. When they seek to enforce their totalitarian view, if there's a price that they have to pay for it, it makes their willingness to enforce that a little less certain. It makes their patience grow weary. It makes their desires to be in control come to the forefront. They maybe tip their hand. They maybe make some mistakes and we can roll them back. There's nothing more frustrating when you work with somebody and they turn out to not be the person you thought they were. Now, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I, I'm sure there are probably somebody out there that has had that happen. Likewise, I'm also equally sure that I'm sure somebody maybe even thinks that about me, right? Oh, that Stephen guy, he seemed to be this way, but, you know, he's just not. No, I don't, I don't know why it, that would be. I'm just saying there's a lot of range of possibilities there. So put your thinking caps on for a minute and just consider... Perhaps that smiley guy or gal we see on TV that's selling us the latest or the latest line of BS is really not our friend. Really doesn't care about us. Perhaps really doesn't like us at all. Perhaps if they were just a little bit more honest, they would be like some of those ball players and they would just turn their back on the rest of us. I'm not suggesting that we need to fight fire with fire in that instance. I'm merely suggesting that don't be disappointed when you see those propaganda machines have a glitch. Don't be wholly disappointed when somebody you thought you could trust, whether they be on the radio or the TV, really isn't who they say they are. Acknowledge the idea that much of what we... Excuse me. Much of what we are experiencing and living through is just fabricated. That's not to say it isn't real. It just means that the reality that we know and see is being played with. I'm still waiting to see the millions of people that have died. I'm still waiting to see all the various other panics that they've put upon us in the last 20 years, whether it's Miami be, Miami being underwater or all the glaciers being gone or running out of oil or, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm still waiting. They create these things to get a reaction. The reaction is what they count on so that they can counter it. And then when they counter it, they just cinch down that little control just a little bit more. They just move that boot just a little bit closer to the back of your neck. They just put their hand just a little bit more firmly around your wrist or around your neck or, or basically around your throat. Tyranny only can exist if we do nothing about it. 
we have to do our best to keep it at bay. So whether it's nice and shiny and pretty like Huxley prophesized, or it's the dark totalitarian nightmare, courtesy of Orwell, at the end of the day, the only people that can stop it is you, is me, is the guy down the street, is somebody that's willing to just say no, somebody that's just going to peacefully non-comply. There has to be a cost to be paid at some point, and you have to decide right now Am I willing to pay that cost? I can't answer that question for you, and I'm pretty sure I've made it clear more than one time what my answer is. And with that, this is According to Callus, and I will see you on the other side.